everyone. Welcome back to the Weekend Ball Podcast. I'm I'm Alex Adams, live here in Jakarta, Indonesia, covering the Canadian men's national team at the FIBA World Cup. Canada has won its first two games against France and Lebanon in impressive fashion, especially against France. Um, thanks to Oren Weisfeld for taking the time and coming on uh, of the Guardian, um, Sportsnet, Yahoo. Am I missing something, Oren? I I know you you have. A yeah, man, time. Raptors Republic. That's that's where I got my start. So it's good to see you doing the the Canada podcast for them. Is I honestly started in the same way, basically doing Canada basketball stuff for them during the twenty twenty one qualifier. So that's that's the best website we got going in Canada. <laughs> best place to get your feet uh wet and, yeah. and start it so shout out to you for carrying on thanks man i really appreciate it and thanks to louise atzman who's been my editor and, and really kind and everyone at raptors republic's been great everyone should check out jonathan chen's stuff but um you're one of the the ogs of covering this team um as well just starting in 2021 but also just following them you know in the dog days i guess as well um, Oren, just what do you make of, of their tournament so far? And especially that win against France, because I don't know we can really glean too much from Lebanon. But w- what kind of performance just or maybe what kind of statement was that Canada win versus France? Yeah, it's like a cliche to call it a statement game, which a thousand people have already. But uh, it's definitely what it was. Um, you know, honestly, it's kind of vindicating to cover this team and and despite all of the sadness that's happened over the years and and you know a lot of people going into this tournament even when Jamal Murray was in the mix a lot of people I knew were like yeah this all looks great but I'm not going to trust it until I see it on the floor like it was almost a curse element to this team where people weren't going to trust it until they they actually saw them succeed so I think that France game was was kind of the monkey off the back for a lot of people and finally allow them to okay maybe get a bit excited for their their opportunities not just in this tournament but you know going forward with this core group because this this group is obviously young they are in it for the long haul it seems like so um yeah just a lot of excitement i think and and definitely vindication for people who have been following and who who believed in the team um like myself and yeah i mean the france game was Something that no one would have predicted. I think I was as high on this team as as anyone Mm -hmm. covering it. Like, I I really believed in them. And yet, I would have said, like, yeah, if they scrape by France, that's great. Even if they lose, they still have a chance of of making it to the knockout round. I would have never predicted a 30-point win. So, every single thing was going well for them. And I think Rowan Barrett deserves a lot of credit. He put together a team that just fits really well together. And Jordy Fernandez deserves a lot of credit, too. Yeah, and and with that, just for you, Oren, how how can things go up from that France game? Because it felt as though that was almost a complete performance. I mean, in a way, you could argue that it's a, a tale of two halves. But how can this team improve? Maybe going up against Latvia and 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 later on in this tournament, like what what's the next gear for this team? Because Jordi Fernandez said every game they want to get better and and they'll be better at um just as the tournament progresses but I I find it hard to believe they can play that much better than they did against France yeah no that's fair I I do wonder I'd be curious to see just like how much better certain teams are than France because we went into the tournament thinking France was going to be a powerhouse and you know the win over the Canada win made you you know shake your head a little bit but then losing to Latvia it's like oh maybe France just wasn't that good in this tournament I I didn't think they were that good honestly Mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see a test in Latvia and then in the next round against Spain who've looked really dominant like they played were you at the Brazil game today Yeah, I was at I was at the end of the the Brazil game yeah 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 no they so they they look good they look really good, but at the same time, I just feel Canada looks they they look good, but they did not look at the level of Canada in in that France game, right? It, it's yeah. almost a notch below the way I see it right now, and I don't know how about you, how you feel about it, but is I would uh, yeah. yeah sorry no no go for it I would agree with that Canada looks like the best team in the tournament so hard, but. You know, it's FIBA. Anything can happen. You can have a bad shooting night. You can get into early foul trouble. So I think 
maybe those are the things you want to look for from Canada in terms of like that consistency. Like, a do their most important players stay out of trouble because like if if that's happening in every game like it did against France, if that's happening in every game, then you might have a cause for concern. And then B, are they shooting well? Like the game against France, you said it was a tale of two halves. It was, but that was mostly because in the first half, they just didn't shoot the ball well mm-hmm. on really good looks, I thought. Yeah. So totally in the in the second half, they just started hitting their threes. Shea obviously got going his individual game. But yeah, if they can hit their threes consistently, stay out of foul trouble consistently, um, I do think the sky's the limit because their defense is just so good. Like they play so hard every night and their defense is so good. When you watch other teams play, it's just, it's a completely different ball game. Canada has so much like length, so much size, physicality, they're playing hard and they're on the same page, which is, I think was the biggest question maybe coming in Mm -hmm. um, is like, how is that chemistry and continuity going to factor in? And, and really like the defense is simple, but it's clean. They're not making mistakes. So um, yeah, it's looking good. I, I think the defense has just been so outstanding, at least so far in the tournament, because in the pre-tournament games, they looked okay, but they, they had the stretch against Spain that they really, in that third quarter against Spain in the pre-tournament games uh, game, that they were dominant. But other than that, there was no stretch like the one they had against France. But if but I, I just, the one guy that keeps jumping out, and, and a lot of people have been talking about him, I mean, he... He was a popular guy in the NBA for a while. Is at least Dylan Brooks, but he just—I don't know what's happened. Maybe a switch turned after getting eighty million from Houston. I don't know, but he's been phenomenal and just everything you want from him. He—he he hasn't taken one bad shot in the tournament. In the pre-tournament games, he maybe took a handful, and that was my biggest worry: is oh, he's just gonna chuck. None of that. He's been a really good corner uh, three-point shooter, shooting the three pretty well. His form looks tight. Watching him in practice, I had a video up. He missed. He made, I think it was 11 straight threes from the corner and obviously wide open FIBA, but um, he's definitely shooting the ball well. Just what do you make of his his game so far for Canada? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, like a a switch has been flipped. It feels that way. I'll be curious to see if it continues uh, in Houston. If it does, a lot of people are going to have to eat their words on the contract uh, because <laughs> if he if he's really like, and I think it happens with a lot of NBA players, it's an underrated thing, but like guys do what they have to do to put food on the table. And now that he has that contract, it wouldn't shock me if he becomes a different player and he's willing to take that veteran role and just buy into the defense and the you know three-point shooting that's what he's done for this team and yeah it it was definitely a worry for me too but yeah I can't really say you said it all there's not much else to say about Brooks he's been just really really good in this starting group their best defender I would say throughout the whole tournament and the pre-qualifying along with Lou Dort I think has also been really excellent um but yeah it's it's definitely a different role than we're used to seeing from brooks and and he is kind of rewriting the narrative a little bit on on himself which is great to see because i think people have misunderstood him for a lot of his career a lot of the times he's had to take those shots for memphis it's not like you look at their roster when jaw is out and see a ton of like scoring and jaw is always out so uh i I do think that's a big part of it again yeah yeah so Yeah, shout out to Dylan Brooks for buying into that role and, and shout out to everyone just, you know, on the whole program for for kind of helping him buy into that role because it's not an easy thing. What's interesting, I think it helps that they're his friends, honestly. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And what's interesting is I, I was talking to Nikhil and he said the word, he said, what's basically your role on this team and how are guys adapting to FIBA? And he said, guys are dumbing down the role from the NBA. And I thought that was really interesting talking about just the sacrifice and maybe mm-hmm. because there's no money on the line here and it's all about uh, making the Olympics first and foremost and then hopefully going deep after that to to maybe medal or, or maybe even get a gold. But do you, do you think the roster construction has really had a lot of set roles and defined roles for guys and that's part of the success? Because for me, I really see it as there's a clear pecking ro- uh, order, sorry, with Shea, then maybe RJ offensively, Kelly, Dylan, um, there's been no one that's really tried to to do stuff 
or play out of maybe their their comfort zone or maybe out of their their strengths and um i feel that's been a really really big part of their success so far in the tournament yeah so i remember like rowan barrett saying a while back that like we're gonna take the the best fitting team this isn't an all-star game uh, all that stuff. And you, you think about it, like with all the NBA talent and you're like, sure, you're going to say that, but at the end of the day, you're not cutting NBA players. Like that was always my approach. Mm-hmm. And I guess I I was surprised to see a guy like Melvin Edgem, like make the team and, and play such a significant role, not just make the team, but play that role. And it's like, you look at like the situation with, uh, Corey Joseph, for example, you know, I, I know that they span it in a way that like Corey wants to, you know, to me, and I'm not reporting, but it, 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 reading the tea leaves, it seems like he was not going to be offered a huge role on the team, and he didn't want to come and and play that. Yeah, I heard. Role. I heard the same thing. Just for the right. record, I, I don't. So, so I think, yeah, and I don't think that was only the case with Corey. There was a couple other guys who were kind of the wording was like that. It's a mutual decision, but again, it seemed like me that those guys were offered small roles and they didn't want it. And so credit to to Rowan and again because I think bringing a guy like Ejem, Trey Bell Haynes, who's actually been a really bright spot, um, who are just willing to play these really small, compact roles but thrive in them, which NBA players might not be willing to play those roles. Um, it's worked out really well so far. And like I said, coming into this tournament, you can look at the roster and you can poke holes in it, but there's no fundamental flaw in it. I just think they have mm-hmm. everything you could need. You have rebounding, you have three-point shooting, handling, you have a big, a couple bigs. Like they, they have everything they need talent-wise, but also just like fit-wise to to win the tournament. In your mind, Oren, is, is Shea the best player in this tournament? Uh, I would go with Luca. Okay. <laughs> As biased I, as I want to be, but Luca <laughs> is pretty outstanding. Luca does like you, you like I. I put a lot of weight into experience, and Luca has a, an insane amount of experience compared to Shea playing the FIBA game, and also just at Real Madrid playing the FIBA rules. So he, yeah, I would say Luca just because like the playmaking, he's a step ahead of Shea. But um, the rest of that roster is is nowhere near Canada. So yeah, like that's the thing. Shea is great, and we can talk about him more. But you look at that France win, and and when I wrote about it, it was like Shea got it going in the third quarter, but this was such a team win, and that's why it was encouraging. Mm-hmm. Like, there's always going to be a game where Shea can bail you out, and that's that's nice, but that's not a uh, what's it called? Like, that's not a recipe you can carry forward. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like the team aspect is, and I feel like we've seen every game, including the qualifiers, like a pretty repeatable format. Um, the starters are good. They're getting better every game playing together. And then Nikhil and Dort come off the bench early and they just like juice up the game with their defense, really. And Nikhil has been shooting the ball really well. And then you get like Kyle Alexander and Ejim in it and they bring that physicality and that rim protection. And it's just like, it's just a really good roster and, and everyone, yeah, everyone knows their role. And, and just with Shea, I, I want to ask just a bit of your philosophy um, because I, I, I'm just curious because with, with Luca versus Shea argument, how much do you take into the account that just Shea's a much, much better defender? Like I, I always find that hard to quantify, but also very valuable. And if you look just in the NBA, um, Luca didn't make the, the play in and probably had just as good a roster in a lot of ways as, as Shea. Um mm-hmm and and she obviously did and and um with a, and w- with a very young roster too it wasn't like he had experienced vets or anything like that so just what do you th- make of that i'm just curious to to pick your brain a little bit yeah i think uh that's an argument i i tend to honestly lean on the side of defense for like when a guy like Giannis or jimmy butler like i tend to overrate those guys because of their two-way impact but Shea is not like an elite defender. He is better than Luca. I agree with you there. Luca doesn't try very hard and Shea does. And that makes a huge difference right there. But until Shea is going to be like an elite defender, um, I can't, I, I guess I don't really like put that much stock into the fact that he's better than Luca on that end. And therefore he's a better player. So that's kind of where I tend to go is just like, um, yeah, I think, I think Luca is a, a better enough offensive player to where I would probably make the case for him. Um, but yeah, Shea's defense credit to him is getting better every season. 
Mm -hmm. And yeah, he's had a ton of steals in this tournament for sure. Um, But he he still, I would say he gets caught flat footy. He gets caught watching off ball. Like he he's not in that tier yet where I, where I think he, he's better than Luca because of it. W- would you say he's like an above average, like a slightly above average defender? Or would he be an average defender? How would you maybe? In this tournament or in the NBA? I mean, uh, I guess in either or just how would you evaluate yeah. his, his defensive kind of profile? I would say in this tournament, he's definitely above average, but in the NBA, he's just cracking average last year. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And I mean, he did have a big load, so that's also part of it, right? Um, that yeah, you see he had a ton of steals and blocks last year, so maybe I'm being harsh, but um, it's also the Hassan he's not exactly side. asked. He he lives the life of having Lou Dort on his team. Like he's not asked to really put up, you know, like those tough matchups. And it's also just the reality of the NBA. You rest on defense when you're the primary guy. So um he's getting better the effort's getting better the the steal and block rate is definitely getting higher and and i think like even as soon as this season i think he'll be above average yeah no for sure and from from shea to to canada's probably second leading scorer that will be probably the case throughout this tournament is rj barrett you had a really good piece about just his ascension on the national team and and just maybe tell us a bit about the piece and, and what have you thought of him so far yeah, sure. So I wrote a big read for Sportsnet on RJ Barrett. People want to check it out. Um, just because going into the tournament, I, I he he's the guy who I mean, things changed with the exhibition games, the way he played. But before that, it was like no one really thought about RJ Barrett. I saw a lot of people thinking he wouldn't even start on this team, and so to me, he was kind of like the underrated guy who people don't really. Because most people just watch Canada basketball once a year and, and they don't really like pay attention. But he just has so much experience with the program, played at every single youth level, um, won the U19 gold against uh, America, which was a huge moment in his career. And, and like he's just kind of been developed through the FIBA game. It's such a huge, huge part of his development, obviously, in part because his father is the GM of the Canadian program. So I just kind of wanted to to dig into that, how it's, how it's affected his development. Um, and obviously predicting that he's going to have a big tournament. Um, you know, this is a different level of competition for RJ. I'll say that like the only time he's played with the senior team before was in that Olympic qualifying tournament against teams like China and Czech Republic. And those are a different level of, he was great, but that's a different level of competition than France and Spain. I still think, He's going to play a lot better than he did against France. You know, I, I don't take anything from that Lebanon game. So we'll no. see tomorrow. Um, But yeah, I just think he has an interesting story. And a big part of the piece, too, is just diving into like his track record in big games is pretty mm-hmm. ridiculous. And so I do think it, it, it when it comes down to those big games and, and we saw it in, in the in the dying minutes of those exhibition games against Germany and Spain, like he's a guy that can really get you a bucket in those moments or just make a play in those moments. Um, and that's something he's done throughout his whole career. So yeah, just, just kind of an interesting story to follow throughout the tournament. No, for sure. And with that, obviously he didn't play well against France. I also think France might be the worst team for him to play against just with a guy like Rudy Gobert, obviously at the room. Although, I mean, I did ask RJ about how he, his, he's, transition from or how his game compares from the nba to fiba and he said the paint's wide open which i just find is such an interesting quote because in a it shouldn't really be because there's no defensive three seconds but um what do you think of the maybe the theory or or with with rj's game just in fiba that maybe guys are a bit less athletic overall Mm -hmm. so he can kind of blow by guys a bit easier than it maybe in the nba and just not the same type of athletes because he's such a good around the basket finisher. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things like a he plays for the Knicks. So that's funny that he says the paint is wide open. I think, you know, it's kind of not a shot at the Knicks. It or might anything, be. But, that's, yeah, that's what Knicks but Canada does. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, a that's little funny. bit. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the funny thing is people like do poke holes in this Canada roster as, as a shooting roster. And yet they do have four guys on the floor pretty much at all times who can shoot the three might not be elite at it, but like who can shoot it. And then you look at the Knicks and it's not 
always that way. So, um, yeah, I could I could see I could buy the the idea that he has more space. I also think a big part of his comfort level is just that. Like, yeah, the size and athleticism is different than in the NBA. It, it is smaller on the wings in FIBA, and, and he can take advantage of that, not against France, like you said. But um, he just has a different level of comfort in FIBA because he actually gets the ball. And I feel like with the Knicks, he's like primarily a catch-and-shoot guy. Once in a while, he'll get to run a second-side pick-and-roll. But primarily Jalen Brunson and... Um, Julius Randle. What's Julius Randle have the ball? Thank you. There. And in this team... And and not just in this, in his whole life playing Canada, he's been a primary option. And that just kind of helps you get your rhythm going. And RJ, to me, is a guy who just gets better as the game goes on. He figures out his spots. And so when you have those reps, when you get the ball in your hands, when you get to take more shots, um, it just makes sense that, yeah, he can. he's a little bit more comfortable and he's a little bit better as a scorer because he just has more opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think RJ's ever had a roster on the Knicks that really suited his game style right they've always had yeah. Robinson who can't shoot and Julius Randle who likes to be around the the paint yeah. and that's where RJ lives and and they've never really had a great three-point shooting team I guess maybe a bit last year but in the, his first three or four years it's really been <laughs> maybe the worst types of teams that or roster construction it's just for his own game as you mentioned um so yeah. uh it's been interesting to see what he's been like just for Canada and hopefully he he turned he looks more like the friendly games rather than maybe the first game um against yeah. France just because uh, he wasn't he was poor but it was a lot of outside shooting so um yeah and, and it didn't matter that's the other thing yeah i know i mean it they, really they didn't matter that he wasn't good and he's still he didn't good, need to be right and he's still a good playmaker i one thing that i really worried about in this ahead of this sermon is is the lack of maybe playmaking and sure, they maybe don't have a traditional point guard, but it's almost for me that everyone on the team, other than maybe a, a couple guys, can play make to some level. Yeah. And the the general playmaking is is at a pretty high level, right? You think about Kelly Olynyk, you think about Shea's a good, decent passer. RJ got five assists in that game against France when his shot yeah. wasn't going. Um, Nikhil. Uh, this team's just a, a pretty good passing team overall that I think maybe we 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 slept on a little bit going into the tournament. Yeah, I agree. It was it was a worry of mine too. And that's a credit to like Canada basketball. Like just the development pipeline that these guys come up through is it's very, you know, it, it's versatile players are are a priority. And even talking to guys like Dwayne Washington at Uplay and Nathaniel Mitchell. Mm -hmm. who are like two of Barrett's primary trainers growing up, like both of them talked about just like that playmaking that how hard they've worked on that throughout his career. And um, yeah, you're seeing a bit of the fruits of, your, of their labor and like RJ's 23. That's, that's mm -hmm. the thing. It's he's a starter on this team. He he doesn't get talked about like he's younger than these guys, but he is, he's the second youngest guy on the team. And so when you talk about like strength based creation or playmaking, all these things are going to get better for RJ as his career goes on. I don't think he's anywhere near like his peak self where, you know, a guy like Brooks might be like might be closer to that peak mm -hmm. at his age. So, yeah, that's that's why I think RJ is, is more exciting. And, and I just don't like the like rep he gets on the Knicks where they have put him in this small role with a team that doesn't suit him very well. And. And now the NBA community is kind of out on him in a way. And I'm just like, I don't get it. He's 23. You know, he, he gets better every year. Um, so, yeah. No, and I, I thought he played really well in the playoffs, right? In 2021, yeah. when the Knicks made the playoffs for only five games against Trey Young, he wasn't very good. But last mm -hmm. year when they when they beat the Cavs, or, or I guess this year, um he was really really good um and mm -hmm. and really felt like oh okay so he's, he's good in the playoffs now unlike maybe julius randall on the knicks so well it might also not be a coincidence that randall was out for that series with the injury and mm -hmm. and that's when barrett really shines so yeah it might just be that i would say julius randall is a hard guy to play with for a lot yeah. of players yeah no no definitely um to another piece of yours you, you talked about dill uh um, Dwight Powell and uh, Kelly Olynyk's kind of chemistry and, and they've been with the national team for so long maybe just tell us a bit about that that story and, and they've been phenomenal together as, as part of the front court here in, in Jakarta for Canada 
Yeah, so that story came from, again, watching the 2021 Olympic qualifying tournament. And I, I wrote at that time for Raptors Republic about like how Dwight Powell was the most important player for that team. And it was just because that was their only big and they didn't have anyone to bring off the bench. The depth was really shaky. And um, he gets in foul trouble in the in the semifinal game and, and plays like 20 minutes and, and they just get crushed on the rebounds. And I was like looking at this roster and I was like, OK, if we are going to poke a hole in this roster, I would say it's it's the front court depth. Mm-hmm. Um, if either of those guys get in foul trouble, you're going to not NBA, you're going to Euro league guys off the bench rather than NBA guys. And so that's kind of the worry. So I wrote the piece. Yeah. In the sense of like, these two guys have a lot of pressure on them to perform and stay out of foul trouble. And because when they're on the court together or just one of them at the five, Canada is just in a really good position so far. So good for sure. I will say Kyle Alexander has impressed me. I didn't, I didn't know he was this good so i am a little less worried if like a dwight powell gets into foul Mm -hmm. trouble because now you have kyle alexander off the bench um but still the point the point stands when you're gonna play like jaron jackson jr if they get that far you need dwight powell and kelly olenic to to be at their best and yeah as this tournament's gone on you've really seen their like two-man game in that in the lebanon game you, you see their connection um their familiarity they played a ton of games together and yeah they they also are like obviously kelly's the captain dwight's the other second highest cap player on the team or i actually think it's edge but but in terms of of nba NBA players i should say yeah um so yeah it's those two have a ton of like responsibility as leaders on this team yeah for sure and they definitely have you know they clearly are friends off the court just the way they interact and then obviously grew up together um and i just think olenix just been it's 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 funny because you you see guys you think of maybe the guys that have beat canada when you think about like maybe a thomas sataransky and a guy who's a decent nba player at the time um i think olenix better than sataransky was like now and, and then but mm-hmm. they come to FIBA and you're like, oh, this is like, this is perfect for this guy. Like he's in his element. This is the perfect style. This is the perfect maybe role for him. Um, mm-hmm. What have you made of Olenek just being so good for this team? It seems like, it seems as though every game he has 13, 8, and 5 or something. Just a really consistent stat line. And his passing is so underrated, right? Like th- th- he always finds a cutter two, three times a game for an easy um layup or dunk and um I, i've just he's just been so phenomenal i, I i've thought uh, so far for canada no i agree he had that one pass to rj in transition against lebanon oh my God. bounce fast yeah, yeah for the dunk yeah um so yeah like that magic. that's a thing yeah so w- with the well first of all with the playmaking worries yeah like olenic just negate so much of that because if you have a guy in the front court who can be that hub you don't necessarily need like a a ball handlers to do those playmaking tasks and olenic's been that for this team and yeah like you said it's just the consistency i guess we've gotten just kind of uh take it for granted now his consistency in in a team canada uniform but really it's like it's pretty mind-blowing um and this tournament, he he's been at his best. He's 32 years old. He just had like a career year in Utah, and now he's playing like this for Canada. It's pretty insane given his age. Um, but yeah, what was the other thing I was gonna say? Oh yeah, like transition. Um, this team is incredible in transition. That's what stands out to me watching them. Mm-hmm. They're not like a traditional FIBA team in that sense. They are just like this nba team in a sense where they are so big and athletic and they just get out and go every i'm sure you see it i even see it from the tv jordy every defense yes. rebound is like yes. go 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 and uh it's interesting they run more than nurse did so you wouldn't expect that with jordy's background in fiba and nurses you know playing with the raptors who are this transition everything team and yet they're actually playing faster with jordy i th- i find that interesting and, and yeah back to Kelly he's a huge part of that you know like if he's at the five or if he's regardless if he's at the four he gets the rebound he's dribbling and he's going down the court and and he's such a good playmaker that usually like they are getting such good looks in transition 
Yeah, no, I mean, uh, Lebanon is not <laughs> maybe the litmus test, but against France, that's really in a way how they, they yeah. broke the game open was just Shea would get the, the board run and then just create right. chaos on, on defense where either going straight to the hoop or, you know, drawing a double team or, or just, and then kicking out and everything else. So um, that's been really nice to see because in, in, in the, pre-tournament games they were good in transition they didn't feel great mm-hmm. necessarily and now it mm-hmm. feels as though they're, they're really bringing it together and i mean dylan brooks is dunking on people and it's just it's been i i, I don't know what's almost changed I, I i know talking to guys around the team before the france game they felt very very confident and i did not feel that way um so maybe that's the nba kind of cockiness and in a good way or confidence um, but let, let's talk to a little bit about Jordy Fernandez, because I think he deserves as much credit as almost anyone on this team so far for maybe their success, just because he had such a tough job, right? It's been less than a month mm-hmm. since he's really taken the reins and had his first day at training camp. And the team looks just night and day from the first game against Germany. Um, when he says we want to be better each game, it really feels as though he's done that. And that's not an easy task. And he's dealing with NBA players. Um, and it just feels like everything's been so seamless for this team. And and maybe there's a wrench thrown in that later on in this tournament. And there probably will be to some extent. But just what have you thought of his coaching so far uh, for the team? Yeah, really impressive. Um, I do think like, I got caught up in it myself, I'll admit, like having those thoughts like, ooh, maybe the Raptors should have hired him, you know? I think he was put in like a pretty cushioned spot, which is a credit to like Rowan, who built this really strong roster that fits together. And the players who, you know, obviously knew that this was a coaching change, knew it wasn't going to be easy for Jordy and um, just kind of bought in, you know, to each other and, and to uh the game plan and all that stuff but with that being said yeah very impressive um i i like you know that that transition stuff is really where i get excited in terms of Mm -hmm. when he talks about this team can get better every game you're seeing it in transition because transition to me is like the biggest chemistry factor like in the half Mm -hmm. court it's more set you know like um I guess there aren't as as many opportunities to be creative in that sense. Whereas in transition, if you know where guys like to play as you play with them more and more, you know, their spots, you know, how fast they can get to this spot, you know, how hard you have to throw the ball in order for them to get it. You know, Um, transition is, I think really where that stuff comes out and you're seeing it every game. They're just getting better and better. So that's where I think they can really keep improving is, you know, getting stops and running. And so, yeah, I, I think the biggest credit for Jordy, what I've seen is just like he's kept it simple. He hasn't tried to overcomplicate things. They run a couple different defenses. They don't do pretty much no zone, nothing crazy um, on offense. There is a clear hierarchy, like you said. There's no Dylan Brooks taking silly shots. It's it's Shea, it's RJ, it's it's Kelly Olenek. And, and, and they're all moving the ball well is another huge thing. Obviously, they had like the record number of assists against Lebanon and that just shows that they're playing for each other which I think a coach uh, has a huge factor in that also the players do because again this is a thing where they're friends they grew up together I I do think that factors in but yeah Jordy deserves credit and to me an an interesting thing is the way he talks about the program like to you guys in the press is like he keeps giving these answers as if he's going to be here for 10 years and I, I find that you know, it's good, but it's not something Nick necessarily did. And as Jordy, like I wrote about this, but a fear is that he gets a head coaching job in the NBA next summer Mm -hmm. and then does the same thing Nick nurse did. And I think I I have a little less of that fear now, just based on the way he talks about, you know, this program, we want to get it to number one in the world, you know, like he keeps giving answers as if he's talking not about this tournament, but about like the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, maybe that's just how he is and where he differentiates from Nick is that he grew up in FIBA. And I mean, to be honest, he knows that this opportunity is, is one of the five best in in the international game. And, you know, maybe he is set in it, in it that strong that like, if he gets an NBA job, 
he's going to keep this job regardless. I hope that's the case for sure. The way he's talking about it makes it seem that way. I have a question for you because it feels being around the team here in Jakarta that they every time it's really it feels like I'm I'm part of the intelligence service when I'm trying to just get questions and answers from Jordy sometimes. I mean, he's he's been very kind and I'm not saying it in a in necessarily a disparaging way. But was that the case for Nick where everything felt very tight lipped um, with regards to anything in in throughout kind of tournaments or qualifiers it was that the case for for nick yeah i would say like do you mean impressors or in like just the whole have you had a the, one-on-one just the whole experience um arash yeah. and i have, have maybe noticed that a little bit so i was just wondering if, if if that's something you noticed with regards to nick nurse no for sure i i mean nick would give good quotes about like you know what he saw and where guys fit and Mm -hmm. what guys did well or not well on a basketball court but if you tried to ask him anything that could be like i guess at all controversial you could say he would never he would never give an answer and yeah i think jordy's the same way and i don't mean controversial in like you're fishing for anything i just mean like NBA people will spin anything. They are so nervous. It, it's what makes yeah. the league bad in in terms of a be, yeah. being a media member. Like they are so nervous of anything being spun against them that if you ask a personal question, basically, I shouldn't say controversial, but a personal yeah. thing, like their philosophy or their you know individual personal something, they will shy away from it. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, definitely felt that, but he's been he's been really nice to us. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, the team, the players have been good. Uh, interviews as well. Um, hopefully, nice. uh, getting Dylan Brooks uh, on just in the mix zone tomorrow. So I think uh, we'll we'll have some funny questions for him. Um, but uh, nice. Warren, I just I just want to before I let you go, what are your expect expectations of this team now? Obviously, after the the two emphatic wins, especially France and. Are they a medal contender? Are they going to get that Olympic spot? What What do you think is maybe the likeliest outcome for, for this team? I mean, it's almost two-pronged in terms of just the Olympics and then how they do in the tournament itself. But what if you had to guess, well, what do you think happens for this team? I would guess that they um, make an Olympic bid. You know, you look at the other side of the bracket, it looks like Dominican will finish second in their group and play the United States in the knockout round i think if if everything goes according to how it's looking right now and so basically that means can has to make it to the quarterfinals because it looks like dominican will and it looks like they'll lose in the quarterfinals if i were to guess against the united states I'm, my my worry is they beat serbia and then they play lithuania or greece yeah. or montenegro and then it's like holy shit uh, canada needs to make at least the semifinal, um, right? I would be surprised if they beat Serbia. That's the thing, and that's a big I, no, game. No, I know. I, I, but we'll I, see. There's also just uh, I was talking. I think I could say this because it's not anything. Um, but I was talking to Michael Bartlett just um, kind of um, around Jakarta here, and he was mentioning that they actually play Angola, and if Angola basically wins by more than five or six points, who's been pretty decent so far that Dominican would be out already um, in, in their last mm. game. So there's a chance if there's an upset that the Dominican could, wow. could be sent home, but uh, we'll, we'll see. But yeah, that's my worry is that they, they beat Serbia and then they play like Lithuania um, who probably could definitely beat them, but is just not USA. Um, yeah, so. no, for sure. Yeah. Dominican's interesting. I feel like they've had really high highs and really low lows. I do think like, like, towns for example in that first game against Philippines against the philippines like he really struggled for the first half of that game i would say like the guards just got into his dribble and he was terrible like he was just giving a ball up all over the place so i do think there is some ways to limit towns because he's such a big scorer for them and i i think if you get into his dribble a little bit it's not like they're setting him up amazingly he's creating a lot on his own so Mm -hmm. anyways i i just think they're susceptible um so yeah i would i guess back to canada um i would i would predict that they do finish the tournament better than the dominican just from what i've seen from the two different teams and who they're going to play going forward 
Um, in terms of they're definitely a contender for a medal. Now it's it's tough like to predict that they will because it's going to be a tough route there, and and anything can happen in this FIBA game. In injuries, bad three point shooting, um, like I said, foul trouble. They're going to have a tough test against you know teams like Germany and Australia potentially. Spain in the next round is going to be a really hard team to beat. Even Brazil could be tough. Not honestly, it's not gonna be really. Yeah, tough I, I watched Brazil and uh today, yeah. and I was with them. Um, I don't know if you know who Scott Witter is. He's kind of the big Canadian yeah. guy, and uh, we weren't that impressed by Brazil. But you never know. Uh, I do yeah. have an exclusive with Bruno. There's a something coming out. Just nice. I did a little interview, so stay tuned. Oh, for nice. that. For, um, Spain does does look good, but talent wise, does not look yeah. nearly on the same level as Canada. So you really, it really feels as though if Canada can play at its peak. Spain isn't really at that same level. Um, but they're not, but I'm impressed with their roster, and I think they're getting better as it like they look better against Brazil than they did against Canada in the mm -hmm. prelims. Um, that second unit looks really good with Aldama and Garuba. Like they have a lot of NBA talent. Yeah. Um, definitely not the same high end that Canada has, but they do have it spread throughout their whole roster, and obviously the continuity is there. So yeah, I guess I'm not getting like too far ahead of myself with Canada because I've been hurt before. But but yeah, just from what we've seen, Canada has been the by far better team. No, and I actually just to, I'm going to plug myself because why not? But uh, I did have a sit down pretty lengthy with Sergio Scariolo um, yesterday. And I mean, he he was very much tempering expectations for the Spanish team. Maybe that's a mindset um, that he wants the players to be instilled by um just talking about how they're just not one of the most talented teams but they're you know they play together they know how to win together um and i, I it's going to be really interesting to see that game because if canada let's say wins by 15 right i'm just making something up which d definitely could happen you feel okay mm -hmm. they they they're playing a team that knows how to play together is really good and uh and just if they win in a convincing style, you feel, oh my God, this team could maybe win uh, this tournament or or make the finals. Um, they do have a tough quarterfinal match. Um, it sounds as though uh, Franz Wagner is out at least until the quarters um, from what I've mm. been hearing. So if he's coming back against Canada, that might be tough. But if Canada wins their group, then they play Australia or Slovenia. I'm not that high on australia slovenia scares you because of luca but they're not as good as they were in 2021 so in a weird way i feel as though the draws opened up for them a little bit um as much as it could in a sense yeah. and i i'd be very surprised i feel after that france game they're gonna make the quarters um i just yeah. don't see them losing to latvia so and and brazil um, that's the thing if they just beat those two teams even if they lose to spain they'll be through yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And I will say this. This is the boldest thing I'll say about Canada is yeah. if they do make it as far as playing the United States, I think they will beat the United States. Wow. Like my worry is teams with like the experience and the know how like a Spain, like a Germany who can muck up a FIBA game and make it uncomfortable. But when you look at the United States and it's like, OK, talent versus talent you know, sure, you it's close. Let's just say it's close in terms of NBA talent versus talent, but Canada has that experience that the United States does not have. So I I I picked them in that game, definitely. Like that's interesting. They do not worry me as much as some of these other teams do. Wow. And and maybe that's just I've I've been unimpressed with them to be honest. Their starting lineup is, is really not good so far. You know, Reeves and, and Halliburton save them every game, and those two look phenomenal. And I'm not saying anything would be easy against the United States, but through two games, you can't look at them and be like, Oh wow, they're running rough shot through the tournament. Did, did you see the Brandon Ingram comments about just his role and yeah. Did, yeah He's so, not playing well. Yeah. And um yeah, I mean, I think Halliburton and Reeves are their best players and obviously Brunson probably and, and Jaron Jackson's a really good de yeah. defensive Jackson player of course scary, to be honest. and, and is a really good for FIBA especially against Canada yeah. where you, you talk about lack of size but for me it was more that that France game made me think okay they can win the gold medal and I really didn't think that was the case prior yeah. to that's so I, I agree with what you're thinking um or saying I, I I've been really high on Germany and with that injury obviously a bit less so 
but to me i i was I think, who was i talking to i've had so many podcasts i think it was vivek jacob and i i put them as my number two on the power rankings behind the u.s um germany so i've i've really liked them but if wagner's out they're just not nearly as good a team right he's just been so, he's such yeah. a good fiba player um and just such a good player overall that uh losing him so anyways Oren, i know you need you need to head out um just uh thanks again for doing this and uh hopefully uh we can do a recap pod when canada beats usa in the, in the finals in september 10th or something like that around then so yeah and and you can you can say you know on august what are we the 29th or something um i was right so thanks again Oren. yeah for- i hope i don't regret saying that one but uh it is what it is. But no, thanks for having me. And shout out to you for all these pods that you've been putting out and, and your coverage questions over there. Keep up the good work. Uh, have you been having a good time? Yeah, no, it's been it's been awesome. Um, been basically uh, uh, running rough shot along Arash Madani. So I feel I know him pretty well. He was actually on my, my podcast behind the play and was going to come on after the World Cup. But he'll he'll come on sometime this week. And he's been great kind of showing me just giving me so much um, insight and, and knowledge and he's been awesome and and Scott Witter has been pretty funny alongside where I don't know if people saw this and we talked about it on our podcast together but he he uh, brought a Dylan Brooks t-shirt to the presser and everyone on Team Canada started noticing him um, where Dwight Powell did a double take and started tapping on Lou Dort and then I think uh, I don't know if it was a fist bump, but Dylan Brooks saw it and it was like, "Hey!" and and so that's been a lot of fun. Um, so it's it's been just an amazing experience, and Jakarta's been great, and um, uh, I th- I think I'll have a, a some other stuff in store, but um, just for kind of high profile guests, um, Michael Grange, Arash Madani, Dan Shulman, and also I'm gonna put together a, a Bruno Caboclo and. Uh, uh, Sergio Scariolo kind of podcast of the two interviews with them. So that's something oh, nice. people can stay tuned for. And um, yeah, uh, Oren, thanks again for this. Um, everyone should should check out your work because you're basically the the OG of, of covering this national team through and through. So um, thanks again. Well, I for- will give credit to guys like Michael Grange and Doug Smith and, and Josh Lewinberg. I will, they've been doing it for much longer than me, but yeah, among them, among the young crowd, I've definitely, uh, I I just mean done a lot about Canada you, basketball. You, you've recently. done a lot of niche stuff on Canada basketball, right? Like you've you've kind of, I don't know yeah. how you describe. I bought it. in. You bought in. You're all yeah. bought in. Now we need to get you a jersey or something when they. I've staked a lot of my career on yeah. them being good. So I, yeah. I have not. I have not at all because I'm only here in Jakarta. Uh, you know, as my first event. So yeah, I have a. I keep telling everyone I need them to win for my own sake. Um, so. Uh, there you go. But uh, thanks, Oren, again for for doing this. Everyone should check your work out at at Yahoo, at Sportsnet. Is there any other places that you want to kind of plug before I let you go? Or no, please? that's pretty much it. Like I'll be writing again. I've been doing these daily recaps about the whole tournament at uh, Sportsnet. Me and Vivek are kind of splitting those duties, and then once the second group stage starts, I'll be writing uh, gamers on Canada at, at Yahoo. Awesome. So, okay. Great. Yeah. You can find my work there. All right. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Have fun. I'm jealous you're in Jakarta. Yeah. Uh, well, it, well, it looks awesome. It looks awesome. Maybe in, in Paris, 2024. That's what I was going to say. There. Let's that's do the it. dream. Let's do it. We'll that's see. the dream, we'll man. See. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Take care. And, and thanks again. All right. Thank you.